Thank you, everyone, for having patience in this interesting interlude. So um, I'm happy to welcome you to this presentation. Um, it's sponsored by the Danby uh, Conservation Advisory Council. Um, it was inspired by the Danby Ag Working Group, which was formed this spring to contribute to farming interests uh, for the new zoning proposals happening in Danby. And this is a second presentation uh, on a set of three agricultural presentation. It is entitled Regenerative Agriculture, Soil Health, Soil Health and Climate Change. Uh, the first presentation was in October and it was called Local Partners and Common Misperceptions. The recording can be accessed uh, by Zoom link in today's calendar entry. All three presentations will also be on YouTube. So speakers for today's presentation uh, will be Graham Savio from Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, Joshua Stone, uh, who started a new Danby based business called Web of Life Regenerative Land Care, and Steve Gabriel of Cornell Farm, Small Farms Program, who's replacing Jonathan Bates from Food Forest Farm. Um, Jonathan is recuperating along with his family from a fire which burned down their house a week or so ago. Um, the remaining final presentation, the third and final presentation, uh, is, will be on conservation of farm land and transitioning it to new farmers. And that presentation will be held next year in January 13th. Um, in, uh, a little addendum to that uh, conservation and transi transitioning to new farmers, the first presentation had uh, a speaker, Barb Neal from Tioga Cooperative Extension. And she sent me an email afterwards saying that uh, Tioga Cooperative Extension has just purchased a 107 acre farm called Hilltop Community Farm, which will have a farm incubator. And uh, it is a place where beginning farmers can lease parcels of land at low annual cost. This is to gain experience for grants. Uh, she explained to us that a new farmer cannot get grants because they don't have the experience. So if anybody wants more information uh, or to tour the farm, they should contact Barb Neal and Cayuga Cooperative Extension, or you can pass it on to me and I will pass it on to her. So um, going directly into today's, tonight's presentation, um, I'm going to let Graham and um, Steve introduce themselves. I just want to say a little bit on Josh because his business is less well known than Cornell. Um, he is an ecologist offering soil biology testing and restoration services in the area. And uh, he happens to be also a neighbor of mine. He's on Nelson Road down from Warren. Uh, I mean, East Miller, sorry. Um, he is a soil food web laboratory technician certified through Dr. Elaine Ingram's soil food web school. Dr. Ingram is a leader in the field of soil microbiology and in research at this, in the soil food web. She is also the author of the USDA's soil biology primer. primer. Uh, that can be downloaded from the internet for free or bought, purchased. You have a little more illustrations if you purchase it. Josh is currently training in the school's intensive soil restoration consulting program. So I think Graham is first on the speaking list. Do you want to take it from here, Graham? Actually, ready? it's me. Josh is first. Josh is first. Oh, sorry. No Josh, go ahead. Sorry, we didn't, we might not have made that clear. All right, great. Now, um, just to be clear, Betsy, um, so we're starting, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes after we would have. Um, 
how should I handle that timing? Should I just kind of move everything up by 15 I'm or not about say that again? I, I'm not worried about time. <laughs> okay. Okay. I said, Great. I'm not too worried about time. Just, uh, Great. I'd rather okay. have everything you want to say than. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Just give me the hook if you need to. Okay. So okay. I am going to figure out how in Zoom now to share screen. Share screen. Janice. I think that. I'm just allowed. I think I don't need to request permission here, right? You got it. We're seeing it. Okay. okay. Great. So I'm going to minimize this. And all right. Hello, everybody. So as Betsy said, I am uh, uh, both a student and a professional in the regenerative ag field. And um, so what I'm going to say here is just the perspective, you know, one perspective, uh, as me and the other presenters discussed a little bit recently as we were getting ready for this, regenerative agriculture is not a is not a regulated term. And so it could mean many different things to many different people. And um, so we'll, we'll be kind of just looking at some perspectives and um, so I'm really happy to be here and and uh, so I'm going to do just some basic background on like why why did this come about why do we care about making agriculture regenerative um, and give some of the the sort of philosophical underpinnings of it and talk about the biology. And I'll just let you know that the biology is, is what I'm most well-versed in. So that's kind of what I might really, what might make me really light up about it. But <clears throat> I also will, just wanna share that um, I guess I came to, to this uh, maybe two or three years ago, I was, you know, in my early forties at an kind of another crossroads in my career. And I got myself out to a talk at Cornell and it happened to be, I found out, um, co-hosted by Finney and Makepeace, who was, um, the co-founder of an organization that I had not heard of before. Um, called Kiss the Ground. And that was a really, um, I'd say a really pivotal, a pivotal evening for me. Um, because, you know, I had studied in college, I'd studied chemistry and biology. And after college, I'd gone into chemistry as in a sort of a, an attempt to head into the green chemistry field. Um, and realized chemistry wasn't the right path for me and then got back into grad school and studied ecology and invasive species ecology. And I worked for a good number of years since then in invasive species biology and ecology. And it really still felt to me like there was something else out there that would really, for me, that would really fit my desire to contribute to kind of a new paradigm that would address some of the bigger issues that humanity is facing. So, um, so it was really that evening with Finney and Makepeace, um, I heard about regenerative agriculture. I hadn't, didn't really know what it was before then. I mean, I heard his perspective and, um, so I'm, I just wanted to set the stage and let you guys know that's how I came to it. And um, I'll share a little more as we go about where things went for me. But 
Um, I was thinking a little about how to start and I, I, I just wanted to throw this quote out that I found recently. I'm not gonna read it, I'm gonna let you guys read it and just take it in for a moment. So I think that really leads into maybe a, a, you know, the question, what is regenerative agriculture? And I think that in this quote by Dr. Christine Jones, who's an Australian soil ecologist, I believe, um, something that points to it, uh, it points to the definition that I, that resonates with me that regenerative agriculture is, is a practice of agriculture that restores, that, that heals and restores soil health and the productive capacity of the land while the land is in production. So it's agriculture that restores, that increases the, the soil health and the co productive capacity of the land while it's in production. So it's a departure from this idea that our agriculture is inherently something that takes away from the health of the soil and the health of the land. And, you know, maybe we'll at best we'll farm for a while and then leave the land alone and let nature repair the damage that we've done, you know, um, and maybe we can help it along with some cover cropping or something. But um, that was, that was amazing to me. It was just an amazing shift in mindset and a very significant shift in mindset that, um, oops, go back, um, that that's possible. Um, so I thought that was really significant for me. And so a lot of, a lot of what's going on out there is degenerative. That's why I think one reason why we've we've come to this point where we're talking this evening about regenerative agriculture and and exploring its its value and its relevance. Um, so there are a number of practices that have become that have kind of developed along with the development of agriculture in our in our modern civilization. I mean, even in older times, but they've developed right on up to the modern era in farming. And that, you know, a short list might include, and, you know, this isn't comprehensive, but um, tillage is one practice uh, that is, that might be considered, you know, in the in the category of practices that that tend to make farming degenerative to the soil and to the land the application of chemical pesticides the application of inorganic fertilizers at rates maybe above maybe like 100 pounds per acre or so and leaving the soil bare, I think would be another, is another practice that's not universal, but it's common enough that I'm, I included here just to, uh, just to note. And these, this general syndrome of conventional farming that again is not universal. There's a lot of variety within what's going on out there, but a lot of it tends to turn soil to dirt. And, and that is, it strips away the soil, the living part of the soil. And I'll talk about that more as I go. Um, and you end up with soil that is in its dispersed state. It's more easily blown away or washed away. So one of the obvious results of this is pretty dramatic loss of, so, of topsoil um, worldwide. And this is the figure for the US. And so to put it into perspective, I don't know if you need it, but um, 1.7 billion tons is enough soil approximately to fill 225 
to fill the Roman Colosseum 225 times. So imagine that amount of soil leaving the fields of our, our nation's farmlands every year. It's pretty astounding. And another way to look at it is four tons per acre per year of topsoil is, is lost. And a ton is about what you can fit into a, the back of a pickup truck. So imagine, you know, an acre is maybe a, a good sized backyard. Imagine in, in, in every good sized backyard, four pickup truck loads of soil being hauled off every day, every, every year, say on, um, you know, first day of spring. That's, it's pretty sobering to me. So the result um, is there's an, an estimate that about a third of the farmable land, a third of our farmland worldwide has been lost in the last four decades. And this leads, you know, to a, um, an estimate that I heard, I think it was that, that night at that talk with Kiss the Ground a few a couple of years ago, that the UN Food and Agriculture Organization estimated fairly, you know, in the last few years that we have about 60 years of topsoil left before what's left of it is gone. Um, I've heard other estimates, but um, so that's, so this is kind of the bad news. <laughs> um, and I'll let you, just take this in for a minute here. There's an interesting, well. There's an interesting paper um, that's available from the NRCS. Um, it's a publication that was written back in 1953 and kind of the aftermath of the, the Great Dust Bowl and um, uh, uh, someone kind of took a look back at, you know, many, many civilizations at evidence for what happened to them and why they, why they folded in. And uh, it's called 7,000 years. Um, let's see. Well, this is going a little slowly here. Conquest of the land through... 7,000 years. So if you, if anyone's interested, more interested in, in hearing about that, um, I'd be happy to forward you the link to that. So so this is really what uh, kind of propelled me into this field, you know, with the background that I have in science and the desire that I've had to contribute to something worthwhile. Um, I just realized like what could be more worthwhile um, to the world because not only, you know, does 90, 95% of our food come from the soil, but as the soil turns from healthy living soil to dirt, it releases a, a, a load of carbon into the atmosphere. And so this is having another effect. Um, so just a couple of numbers here, and I believe these numbers probably should say tons as in T-O-N-N-E-S as in metric tons. Um, and this is an estimate from a few years ago. So, um, 700 billion tons of carbon in the, in the earth's atmosphere, by about 550 billion tons of carbon in the biosphere. That's all the living beings on the earth. The, the pedosphere is the Earth's soil layer, not including the lithosphere, the rock layer below, but just the, the layer of soil around the surface of the Earth. Um, there's an estimate that that holds 2,300 billion tons of carbon. So just to put it into perspective, it's, there's a pretty big pool of carbon in the soil. And since the agricultural revolution, um, the the farming that we've been doing has been um, releasing that carbon has been contributing to the release of that carbon into the atmosphere. 
And there's an estimate that uh, about 136 billion tons, and I think that should be metric tons, um, can be attributed to agriculture. Now, I think the total is estimated. There are different estimates out there. I won't get into quibbling over which one's right, but um, but I'd say uh, I'd say the agriculture. It sounds like it's contributed about 15% to the to the total release of carbon that's happened into the atmosphere in the last few hundred years, 200 years, maybe two to 300 years. So, all right, let's see. Let me, I'm just gonna play a very short little excerpt here. I hope this works. sequestration. How effective could soil carbon sequestration be in the struggle against climate change? Well, estimates vary, but here are some reasonably conservative numbers. Atmospheric carbon levels are currently just over 410 parts per million. That's totally off the charts. When you look back over the last 450,000 years, as climate scientists have been able to do using ice core samples, this number has not been above 300 parts per million in that time. The red line on the graph is temperature change. As you can see, there has been a clear correlation between temperature change and atmospheric CO2 over the last 450,000 years. If the temperature continues to rise in accordance with current CO2 levels, then we're going to see some dramatic changes to our habitat. Just to put that in perspective, humans have only been on the planet for around 200,000 years, so we have never seen conditions like those currently being modeled by climate scientists. What is considered a safe level of atmospheric carbon? According to the United Nations IPCC, this is somewhere around 350 parts per million. That's around 60 ppm that need to be removed from the atmosphere, which equates to approximately 450 billion tons of CO2 equivalents. We're going to need this number in just a minute, so let's put it over in the corner here. How much of this can be sequestered into the soil? The answer is, we don't know. What we do know, however, is that it is possible to sequester in excess of 10 tons per hectare per year, and possibly as much as 20 tons per hectare per year, as demonstrated by Dr. David Johnston at New Mexico State University, who has been successfully restoring the soil food web. Yes, this is cutting edge research, but with more investment, this could possibly become achievable worldwide quite quickly. Humans manage approximately 5 billion hectares worldwide. So based on 20 tons per hectare per year, that equates to 100 billion tons per year. Total greenhouse gas emissions for the entire planet in 2019 were around 37 billion tons. About 50% of emissions get absorbed by natural processes, according to research by NOAA, leaving around 20 billion tons in the atmosphere. So if we did nothing else but regenerated the world's soils, we could potentially sequester about 80 billion tons per year. 450 billion tons divided by 80 billion tons per year means that we could theoretically get back to 350 parts per million in the safe level within six years, just by regenerating the world's soils. Of course, we cannot do that overnight. Allowing time for global implementation, 10 to 15 years is a more re realistic time frame. If you factor in reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the picture begins to look far more optimistic. The bottom line is that this could be a big piece of the puzzle when it comes to fighting climate change. So All right. Thanks for humoring that. I wanted to let him say that because he said it so much more smoothly than I could have. And I think it just demonstrates that there's, you know, there are, there are some assumptions there, obviously, that, um, that we could talk about. But um, 
it, it's, it's a signal that there's great potential in soil building, in drawing down atmospheric carbon into the soil to address the climate emergency. And so, um, so let's look at this a little bit more. Let's look at the, the mechanism of it. What's at, kind of at the root of the soil carbon connection? Um, so if you look, well, if you can visualize it, um, and as I have here, there's an exchange going on between plants and that's just about all the plants in the world. I mean, most plants put their roots down into soil with a few exceptions. And, um, and over the last 500 million years that plants have been on land, they've developed, well, probably it happened even before that, but um, certainly by a half billion years ago, um, there began to develop a symbiosis between plants and the microbiome, the microbes in their root zone. And that, that microbiome has come to be known as the soil food web. And um, there are many members of this soil ecosystem that play a part in cycling nutrients for, for plants. Um, but some of the, the major ones are fungi, bacteria, nematodes, and proto protozoans. Um, but obviously there are, there are other, there are micro arthropods and larger arthropods and, and there are nuances. There are different types within those functional classes of organisms. There's great diversity. Um, and then there's the, the, the mammals and the birds and, <clears throat> um, and this is what I've been studying for the last couple of years, um, because, you know, after I, I took, I left that talk at, at Cornell with Finian from Kiss the Ground, I, I just thought, okay, what next? And I, I jumped into a, a two month soil class put on by Kiss the Ground that was really not for scientists. It was for anybody who wanted to learn about this and to learn how to advocate for soil. And, um, and after that, I, I, you know, I left that course and just immediately started looking for what's next for me and having a scientific background and just, a, 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 um, uh, tendency toward that. I, I, I looked around and I found Elaine Ingham's soil food web school. And so that is embodies the kind of what I might call the soil food web approach of the regenerative agriculture arena. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's based on the, the premise that you can, you can directly reintroduce soil life that's been lost through conventional soil management and through disturbances of really any kind the his, the, uh, the whole historical legacy of disturbances that a, a piece of land accumulates over the years and and when you're talking about agriculture it's it's often it land has been tilled and tilled and tilled and left bare and um, and it's got a load of 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 salts also known as inorganic fertilizer that are wonderful for plants but at other than fairly low concentrations they dehydrate the microbes that plants have formed normal in under normal conditions this symbiosis with and so when that symbiosis is broken, the plants will gobble up that, um, you know, that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that in that inorganic mix, and um, but they won't get 
the dozens and dozens and do dozens of other micronutrients that would have been delivered by the bacteria and the fungi that are normally living around, you know, coating their roots. And, you know, these bacteria and these fungi have um, enzymes that plants don't. And they're busy dissolving minerals from the sand, silt, and clay and rock from, you know, around the roots and also from the organic matter that, that's, that's hanging around the area. And they're making that available. Um, and then um, the one more step that's needed to have a fully functioning, I mean, okay, this is a simplification. This is an oversimplification of nature, but so I, I want to just acknowledge this reduction that I'm, you know, doing here, because anytime you kind of reduce nature and the, the, the complexity of nature and the universe to like, you know, a, a simple story, a lot is being reduced out. So, um, but this, this reduction, I think people are finding is useful and it points to something useful. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, the bacteria and the fungi um, have the enzymes to, to take all these dozens of, you know, boron and gold and zinc and, and nitrogen from the air and the pore spaces um, of that soil. And, you know, and the fungi have, you know, have long filamentous strands and they extend the capacity of the roots of the plant to, to you know, retrieve water that might not be in the immediate area of the plants. Um, and, but the, the next trophic level up, the protozoans and the nematodes are needed um, because they come along and eat the bacteria and the fungi and accumulate this very concentrated nutrition, plant nutrition that, that has um, come into the plant, the bacterial and the fungal bodies. And, um, and the, these predators collect that very, very concentrated nutrition and then poop it out right in the plant zone in plant available form. So it's a very simple but elegant system. There, there are other, there are exceptions like the rhizophagy, rhizophagy cycle where in some, I think more limited cases, plants can actually take in microbial nutrition directly, but usually there, there needs to be a more complex community of organisms to um, achieve, to, to have intact nutrient cycling. And this is a normal process that happens in any undisturbed ecosystem out there where there are plants. And I don't know that there are many or any ecosystems that don't have plants. So um, this is how nature does it. And this is the system that's being interfered with by um, very well-meaning, <laughs> by our, our very well-meaning efforts to grow food for ourselves. And so I'm going to leave it there. And well, I will say that um, the, the approach that I'm learning is you can actually use a microscope, take a sample of soil, and you can see what's in there. You can see if, if the fungi is intact. You can see if there are any predatory protozoans or nematodes. That, that are essential for nutrient cycling. Um, you can see the approximate diversity of the fungi and the, and the bacteria. You can see if they're all, just all little, tiny little round bacteria, if there's a mix of you know, those and some a little bigger and some rods. And um, you, can, you can see if there are any organisms that are likely disease causers. Um, and so this just kind of demonstrates, um, you know, a set of tools that I'm familiar with, so I'm sharing about them. And I think that it's sort of the soil food web approach, I think is a useful lens in that it, it explains a lot of what's going on, even in agricultural practice, agricultural systems that are doing, that are, that are building soil, um, 
this sort of is a mechanistic approach to it. And I think that's, for me, that's pretty neat and, and helpful. And so when I take a sample of soil and prepare it um, quantitatively, I can tell, you know, this is a picture that I've, I took with my microscope camera. Um, this is a, a fungal hypha. This is the, the sort of um, what a single strand of fungal cells looks like as it ramifies, as it grows out of a spore. There's a spore somewhere back there. <laughs> um, and if this was better in focus, you'd, you'd be able to see like a nice little bulb shaped thing that's a little shell that uh, an amoeba has built. It's called a testate amoeba. And that testate amoeba is, is you know, since the, the shaking that I did of the sample and, and pulled some uh, organic matter in and, and, you know, retreated inside its shell, but ordinarily in soil, it comes out and it's eating, it just gets busy eating bacteria. And every once in a while, lets out a, a, a little poop of, of plant available nutrition. And um, so here's another, another picture. And, and this is another, this is a testate amoeba in a little better focus. This part's the amoeba inside there. And it's got a little protective plug of organic matter that it pulled in inside itself. Um, can you guys see my little cursor, my little mouse arrow moving around? Great. Okay. So, and if you look, there are lots of little dots here. And some of the, the bigger things in here that might look a little jaggedy, um, like over here, up in the upper right corner, that's probably it's probably a grain of sand. Um, and then there are some smaller ones that would be silt and the very tiny ones are either the smallest bacteria or they're clay particles. And you can tell the difference because clay particles are jaggedy and the bacteria will be smooth. So just a little kind of um, sharing about, uh, you know, the, some of just a visual kind of of some of the the members of this, not only the, the, the living part of this picture, but the, um, the, the mineral part too, which is, which is important, plays an important role. So in a, in a normal um, situation, undisturbed situation, um, a plant sends roots down and there are fungi and bacteria and also the, the predators that aren't pictured here. And there's this exchange that's going on, this symbiotic relationship where the bacteria and the fungi are kind of in, in different ways delivering the plant nutrients, the nutrients that the plant needs. And the plant amazingly pho is photosynthesizing, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of the air, um, and producing quite a bit of photosynthate, sugars and simple carbohydrates, and those are turned into other things, proteins, and, and they exude out of their roots as much as half or sometimes even more of what they make by photosynthesis to cultivate that community and to feed that community and promote the bacteria and the fungi and, and the sort of community, the ecosystem that grows up around those roots. Um, so it's very much a partnership and there are, there are signs that the, the plant, I mean, there's one perspective that the plant's in control and can, you know, put out certain exudates, certain types of sugars and carbohydrates and, and small organic molecules, small to medium sized organic molecules that will feed the particular strains of bacteria and fungi that they need in order to mine the certain minerals and nutrients that are needed at a certain stage in the plant's development or a certain seasonal stage in the plant's annual um, annual life. So it's pretty amazing. There's a real partnership going on there. 
and this is just a little a little electron micrograph of a the tip of a root and you can see the mycorrhizal fungi um, so most plants most vascular plants in the world are are they associate with mycorrhizal fungi which basically um, uh, they grow into the roots into the um, cells of the roots themselves and they sort of extend out for a long way into the soil um, more than 80 percent of vascular plants uh, um, depend on this relationship with this fungi mycorrhizal fungi to to have kind of normal nutrient uptake and so anyway i was going to recap here but uh, i'll move on <laughs> okay so does anyone know, um, and feel free to just unmute yourself and, <laughs> and talk or, or if someone, I don't, I don't have, I can't see the chat when I'm, I have my presentation here. So um, someone, maybe Betsy, if you could keep tabs on the chat. What's the largest organism ever discovered on earth? Does anybody have any ideas? Isn't that enormous fungal body out in the Midwest? Yes, yes, Pacific Northwest. You got it. The humongous fungus in Oregon. It's in a state park, I believe. I don't remember what it's what the park is called offhand, but there is a species of armillaria, oyster, oysteria or something. I forget this, the, the species name that has been discovered. There are several individuals out there in this forest that are enormous. The, and the biggest one is estimated, it's hard to know for sure, but it, the, the, the larger range, the larger limit of the, esti the estimate of its size is it could be up to 35,000 tons, a single individual fungi. And it's, um, it's could be as, as old as 8,000 years old, although maybe only 2,000. <laughs> so um, that's a lot of carbon that, um, is pr predominantly being, you know, it starts with the plants in the area. They're taking carbon dioxide out of the air and they're doing their amazing, the amazing gift that, that nature has bestowed on them of photosynthesis. And they're pumping, continually pumping exudate out into the soil to feed the fungi around their roots. And the fungi are incorporating that into their cell walls and fun fungal hyphae are predominantly carbon based and they will extend for miles and they'll form complex networks and you know a single fungal fungal individual could be thousands of pounds so that is just a pretty cool example of the potential of a healthy soil ecosystem to store carbon. I just wanted to throw this in there. You know, there are less dramatic examples probably all around the world, but still quite significant amounts of carbon being stored in the soil. And that carbon stays in the soil for hundreds of years. So it's not carbon that just kind of, you know, as soon as the, fun the fungus dies, it, it dissolves back and gets blown off as carbon dioxide. As long as the soil remains relatively undisturbed that carbon is sequestered there for hundreds of years um so a lot of um what's happening as this community of bacteria and fungi and protozoans and nematodes are doing their dance is the bacteria are making glues they, they you know bacteria will be sort of bu bumping along in the soil solution and um, we'll sense a little bit of organic matter or a little bit of a mineral matter or something yummy. And that bacteria will produce some glue and it will glue itself to that little bit of organic matter. And that might happen to you know 10 or 12 or, or two or 300 bacteria. They'll produce glue around this bit of organic or mineral matter or both. You know, there'll probably be organic and mineral matter. And then, fungal hyphae will come along and will take these little 
they're called microaggregates that are glued together by bacteria. And the, the fungal hyphae will come and will bind, you know, 10 of those, 20 of those, 100 of those together and make macro aggregates. And around those aggregates, there are pore spaces where air can infiltrate from above and also water can, can infiltrate. And, you know, the larger protozoans and nematodes come through and they make their channels and, um, and they can sort of move things around and contribute to this sort of porous situation. Um, and that structure is the structure of healthy soil. That's the structure that happens in relatively undisturbed soils that has that normal community of soil life. Um, and, you know, so carbon-based glues. Um, and so just for instance, glomalin is, uh, is a, it's a glycoprotein. It's a protein with some carbohydrate attached that was discovered back in the 90s. I can't remember the name of the scientist, a USDA scientist. And this was... Um, identified as a component of mycorrhizal fungi. And mycorrhizal fungi is almost universal in ecosystems because so many plants, almost you know, 80% of plants, there are some plants like brassicas, cabbages, cabbage, kale, broccoli, and then the wild plants that are, you know, that are like them in natural ecosystems that are not mycorrhizal, but a lot, the majority of plants are. So there's a lot of mycorrhizal activity going on. And it was discovered that glomalin is actually as much as 30% of, of makes up as much of 30 as 30% 30 of the carbon in undisturbed in soils of undisturbed soil ecosystems. So just another case in point that there's some pretty serious um, it's the soil organic matter is typically about a little over 50% carbon, just to throw that out there. Um, so if you ever see SOM, soil organic matter, just think of that as that's a small majority of that is carbon, Mo you know, a small bit more than half of it. Um, so the life that's in the soil in under normal circumstances, when soil is, is well taken care of, that biology is what is it's that symbiosis, plants pumping in, you know, the, the carbon pump, the plants, the carbon pump, and then those, or those microorganisms growing and taking up that carbon into their bodies and producing glues. I think, I think glomalin actually might be a part of a, a glue complex of the, um, of the fun fungi um, that it uses to glue together macroaggregates, soil macroaggregates. If I'm not mistaken. So, um, so let's see. How are we doing for time here? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I just want to touch on that there are there are some practices that um, that many folks who are interested in regenerating soil in practicing agriculture that regenerates soil are finding are helpful tools. Um, and I didn't have a chance to make separate slides of these, so I'm just gonna run through them. So, um, I mean, I think it's easy to see from what I've described about how minimizing disturbance to the soil can be really helpful because when you disturb the soil, when you till up the soil or turn up your garden too much, you're, it's, you're making it very hard for that fungi, which is long, delicate, filamentous, um, or their, you know, their bodies are primarily these long, delicate, filamentous strands within the soil. And when that soil gets all shaken up and turned up um, and broken up, it slices and dices the fungi. So, and the larger predators get um, get uh, killed as well. So often in, the, in this case where there's a lot of tillage, 
um, you get you end up with very bacterial soil. Bacteria will survive almost anything, but not necessarily diverse bacteria. So, um, and you know, just to recap, living roots keep having living roots in the ground as much as of the year as possible. Um, and this is you know one way this is this is being accomplished is with cover crops that can be put down at times when your cash crops aren't in the ground. And, um, and what happens is you, you get, when you have those living roots in the ground more of the year, um, it's the, that carbon pump is continuing to feed the soil and to feed the microorganisms in the soil. The carbon, those plants are acting like carbon pumps. Um, so when they're not there, there's, you know, it's not the worst thing, but there's no active feeding of the soil microbiome. And so that will, you know, if you don't have living roots in the ground or you don't have them for a good chunk of the year, then you're not getting that um, benefit of the, the, the microbes, the microbial bodies, you know, growing and being fed and bringing carbon down into the soil. Um, soil armor is just basically keeping the soil covered. Um, and now I'm not gonna, I think I can't talk too much more, but that's, that's there's a modulation of temperature that happens when, when, you know, versus when there's bare ground versus ground with some green cover. Um, the the microbial community in, in bare ground can heat up in direct sunlight the soil can heat up very high and get um, lethal to the soil community um, and also having bare soil can allow too much evaporation and and make it hard for the the soil to stay moist um, and for moisture to be regulated um, so there are a number of reasons why soil armor is kind of a, a principle of regenerative agriculture and animal integration. I'm not going to say too much about that. I'm suspecting that one of our other speakers may be able to talk more about that. But um, but there there is uh, there has there's a common sentiment that you know in natural ecosystems there are, animals play a part in soil health by the the different actions that they they manifest on the land um, with their eating of some of the vegetation and the pooping out of some of it and the trampling down of some of it and um, they have a real can have a real powerful soil restoring effect and soil maintaining effect and um, increased biodiversity is the last one um, and I I don't really um, my experience, I don't have a lot to say about this one, but um, but I think, you know, increasing diversity of plants in agricultural systems means that different plants are going to be feeding the soil, you know, with different exudates and, um, and, you know, when you bring in perennial plants, not just annuals, then you have um, potentially more exudate coming in and um, and kind of you set the stage for a more diverse soil ecosystem and pollinator ecosystem. So um, I think I'm getting the sense that I should probably wrap up here so we so our other speakers don't aren't too rushed. So um, I will just say about water. I mean, there's there's a a, a, st a statistic going around out there on the web that for every one percent increase in soil organic matter, your soil can hold 20, your land can hold 20,000 gallons more water. So um, I think there's, you know, it's an, it's an estimate and, and there are probably other competing estimates out there, higher or lower, but um, it's something to think about. It's pretty profound. I mean, for in an era where there's some pretty um, extreme weather patterns right now, and to have a system, you know, to to be able to 
increase the organic matter through these practices and have that have that profound an impact on your land's water holding capacity. So not only is land that's been regeneratively farmed full of pore spaces that allow water to infiltrate pretty easily, it also has this property where that's, that soil can hold on to the water for, for longer. And it doesn't, um, it, it infiltrates and it, and it, it stays there for longer. And it doesn't just kind of run off and carry your soil with it. So um, there's, this is, these are some, some of the things to be said for regenerative management. So um, I think I'm gonna leave it there. And yeah, hopefully that leaves our next speakers with enough time. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, it's it's hard to hard to follow up your your beautiful slides. Um, my slides are, are going to be substantially um, drier, so um, I'll share my screen here. And presentation mode. All right. Can can you see the the presentation mode, or are you seeing the background slide? Or sort of okay great all right well thank you um so th yeah that was a that was a fantastic introduction to some of the some of the biology and the science be behind um regenerative agriculture soil health um and sort of nutrient cycling in soil and th the i'm going to talk about sort of a zoom way zoomed out on a way zoomed out level um, how the government is facilitating some of those sorts of practices, the sorts of practices that Joshua talked about. So things like cover crops and, and reduced tillage and incorporation of animals, th those sort of practices that Josh went over at the end. Um, so how, how government is facilitating those things through policy and, um, and then how other programs might facilitate some of those sorts of practices in, in agriculture. Um, and the main, the main support program I'm gonna talk about is payment for ecosystem service programs. So I'll give you a brief introduction to what those are and then talk briefly about one that we're thinking about here in Tompkins County. So, and yeah, that's, so that's what I'll be doing. We'll be doing a little bit on federal policy and then jumping into state policy before the payment for ecosystem services section. So there's a couple points um, where federal policy is getting interesting when it when it comes to regenerative agriculture and and um, the nexus of agriculture and climate change in particular. Um, and so one one of those points is is in in an executive order that President Biden signed back in January. Um, part of that executive order about climate change and, and sort of prioritizing climate change as a um, across across all of the executive branch of government as, as a priority. Um, so part of part of that prioritization was saying that the Secretary of Agriculture will also um, start thinking about climate change in specific ways. Um, and one of those one of those ways is this this bit, which is um, putting together a task force, that would put together a report making recommendations for agriculture and, and climate change. Um, and I found it kind of interesting that the bolded bits here are, um, you know, where this is particularly relevant to um, sort of regenerative practices and the sorts of practices, again, that Joshua was, was talking about. Um, and I should acknowledge that, uh, that this, this federal policy conversation was informed greatly by um, my colleague Ariana Taylor Stanley, who lives right in Tompkins County and works for the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, so works on, on federal lobbying and knows knows a ton about this stuff. So if you have real in-depth questions, I, I will direct you to her. Um, so, okay, here we are. So that, So the Secretary of Agriculture was directed to put together a report a 90 day um, a, a report on on how to how to accomplish the goals set out in President Biden's executive order. That report, uh, the 90 day progress report for that report was released this summer. 
and it had a number of priorities laid out, including means of quantifying and tracking and reporting the benefits of climate smart agriculture, leveraging existing USDA programs, doing education and technical support, market approaches. The interesting one that I pulled out here, I, so I didn't include any of those in the slide, that the interesting one was the second one. Um, it's not it's not always the case that um, that the government does a great job of of ensuring that these sorts of initiatives, especially from the USDA, um, reach farmers of all types. Um, so our, our our structures are very good at supporting some farms, and and they're we're working on getting them better at supporting other farms. Um, and this so this was laid out in 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 these recommendations that it needs to work for land managers of different sizes and operation systems. And they also acknowledge here, and this is the only place in this report that the word regenerative shows up. They acknowledge here that USDA recognizes that black and indigenous farmers and ranchers have been innovators in regenerative agriculture, um, which is kind, kind of an exciting thing um, that that's, that's coming down right from the top. Um, and also, as I noted, regenerative agriculture as, as, a, as a word, as a term, doesn't show up elsewhere in, in these recommendations um, that came out of the president's executive order about agriculture and climate change. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, um, again, sort of the, um, the umbrella of regenerative agriculture can be construed in a lot of different ways. There isn't, as Josh said right at the outset, there isn't a specific sort of definition um, that's recognized. It's not a regulated term, but um, regenerative agriculture is associated with those sort of five practices that Joshua went through. And the way those practices show up in, in, um, in sort of the, these, these documents is often in the context of, of climate change. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that throughout. Um, so moving on from, from that executive order and, and how that's moving along and the priorities that are being set there, uh, the Build Back Better Act, which is currently making its way through Congress, and I haven't listened to the news in the last 12 hours, so it seems like things are moving forward all the time or changing all the time, so I don't know where it is today. Um, but the Build Back Better Act includes a number of really exciting investments in um, in agriculture and, and in climate smart agriculture. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to read all of these off, but just for context, $28 billion dollars is about a 50% increase in the total spending on conservation programs in agriculture over the last um, the last farm bill. So that allocated something like 20, 20 billion dollars. So this is this is a, a bunch of money being allocated for um, programs that that really do a, that really do a good job of facilitating and incentivizing conservation and again these sort of broadly defined regenerative agricultural principles like um, you know like reducing tillage like keeping living roots on the ground um, those two in particular are incentivized and, and facilitated really well some of the other ones are, are maybe a, we have some work to do um, and just to highlight a couple of these things so most of this money is going to the environmental quality incentives program equip nine billion dollars of, of the 28 billion and that's a program that, focuses on, um, in, in many cases, identifying resource concerns on farms and fixing them. Um, so one of the things that EQIP funding can be used for is to fence livestock out of, out of waterways. Um, another thing that it can be used for is, um, is manure storage pit covers. Um, also, a lot of folks in our community end up getting um, getting uh, greenhouse greenhouses paid for through the equip program so it's been a big a big benefit in in Tompkins County in that respect um, and another one that I would highlight here is the conservation stewardship program which kind of takes the flip side approach um, and instead of identifying resource concerns and 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 resolving them so find finding um, you know points points where pollution is is a problem and then and then helping helping the farmer 
make sure that that pollution is not a problem. Um, conservation, the conservation stewardship program, the CSP program, um, works with farms where there are no resource concerns identified and pays those farms to then invest even further in, um, in sort of stewardship and conservation activities. Um, and then the, the, the particularly new thing here is a carbon, sequest carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions quantification program at the bottom there, which is a relatively small um, line item, but it's, it's super exciting. Um, and that's, that's kind of laying, laying the groundwork for, um, for future programs where farmers can potentially get, um, get compensated for those sorts of things. And the final part of federal policy that I'm gonna to touch on here is the Agricultural Resilience Act, which was introduced earlier this year. And I can't speak to where it is right now or how, how far along it's moved. Um, there's a whole bunch of components to it. I just pulled out the highlights here that I think are again, particularly relevant to regenerative agriculture principles and to climate change. Um, so it's doing, it, it would provide, um, provide funding for a number of investments in soil health programming. Um, it would support small scale meat and poultry processing, and it would work with, um, it would create a program that would help prevent grasslands from being tilled under and turned into, into croplands. So again, I'm, I'm not sure where this one is in its, in its way through, through Congress. Um, we'll move on to state policy here. So I'm, I'm sure folks are aware, it seems like there's a general awareness at this point, especially in Tompkins County about the CLCPA passed in 2019, set some really aggressive goals for New York State. I laid those out here. Um, the way that agriculture comes in here is that the Climate Action Council, which is tasked with sort of establishing the plan for how the, the CLCPA is actually gonna be implemented, so the Climate Action Council has an advisory panel, an, an agriculture and, and forestry advisory panel that worked from last summer, so summer of 2020 through the spring of 2021 to come up with recommendations about how agriculture and forestry can play a role in both in, in reducing emissions from that sector, which are pretty low at this point, depending on your, your estimate, Direct emissions from agriculture in New York State are estimated somewhere around 4%, but if you're looking at whole food systems, um, emissions from the whole food system, they're, they're likely higher. They're higher than, than that 4%. Um, so the Agriculture and Forestry uh, Advisory Panel was tasked with thinking about how to reduce those emissions and also how to implement negative emissions to sequester carbon in the ground. And it's the only... It's the only one of the panels that was that had this on their mandate to think about how to actually take carbon out of the air. So the final recommendations that came out of that agri agriculture and forestry advisory panel included a number of things that I, I think are um, a little less uh, relevant to the regenerative agriculture conversation, um, thinking about al alternative manure management, precision feed and forage management, nutrient management. Um, so alternative manure management, again, is, is sort of covering, um, covering manure lagoons and it, to ensure that the methane doesn't, doesn't come off of them, which is really a, a big deal when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I don't think it necessarily fits within the, the umbrella of regenerative agriculture. Um, so the, the two that I, that I think are, are more relevant here are the, the soil health recommendations and I'm not going to read the whole thing there, but they align reasonably well with um, with the, the principles that Joshua was talking about. So having, um, in particular, having perennials incorporated in, into agricultural systems, um, other work on, on soil health, and um, and then right in these recommendations, they, they recommend establishing a payment for ecosystem services mechanism within New York State. And then the other recommendation that came out of that advisory panel um, was, was with regard to agroforestry. So talking about adding trees into agricultural production systems because 
trees. In, so in addition to all the carbon that's going into the soil, again, as Joshua talked about those mechanisms with, with the, you know, the glomalin and, and all that good stuff, um, there's clearly a, a whole bunch of carbon that's fixed in, in tree biomass. So if you incorporate trees into your production system, in addition to fixing the carbon in the soil, you're fixing the carbon in above ground. And so that they have a couple of recommendations about how to go about that. There's already a climate resilient farming program in New York State that's administered by the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. It, it currently includes three tracks. There's a, there's a, I'm not going to get into the tracks. One of them is soil health. They want to add agroforestry as, as another track. Um, and they particularly called out here two specific agroforestry mechanisms or, or systems. Um, including alley cropping and silvopasture, and I'm not going to go into those because I think Steve is going to go into them at the end. Um, another state policy that we'll mention here um, is the Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act, which was passed earlier this year, and it hasn't yet been signed by the governor, um, but it's it's looking good. Uh, it's passed by this by um, both both um, both parts of the legislature, the New York State Legislature. Um, so the purpose of the legislation is to enhance and maintain the health of soil on farms to improve farm productivity, protect natural resources, reduce the effect of farming on climate change, and mitigate the impact of climate change on farming. And it proposes to do it in using soil health practices and principles that are pretty much exactly the ones that, that Joshua outlined before, uh, minimizing soil disturbance, maximizing soil cover, maximizing diversity, maximizing living roots, and integrating animals. And so this is hopefully going to be signed into law in New York State um, before too long. Um, the that uh, act goes on to define specific practices that that would be um, that would be encouraged, facilitated, and I, ideally funded. Currently, the, the the act doesn't have a funding appropriation associated with it. Um, but these are all. Many of these align reasonably well with, with the aforementioned five principles. Um, and we don't necessarily, well, actually, this is, this is a little bit of a bridge to the payment for ecosystem services uh, conversation. So the, the soil health practices that the Climate Resiliency Act in New York State is, is encouraging um, have implications for uh, for erosion, sedimentation, water infiltration rates, water holding capacities, nutrient cycling within fields, um, downstream nutrient loading. So, these are all these are all uh, these are all ecosystem services. So, water in, increased water infiltration rates into soil, water holding capacity in soil, um, mitigating erosion and sedimentation. These are ecosystem services that, that this, this act is actually talking about. So I'm gonna move on to talking about payment for ecosystem service programs. So in, in sort of the, the, the simplest terms, payment for ecosystem service programs provide financial incentives to farmers for implementing farm management practices and systems that provide ecosystem services. So that provide clean water downstream, that increase soil water holding capacity, that sequester carbon, that facilitate pollination of crops, that provide other quantifiable um, ecosystem benefits. So th this, this diagram walks through a, sort of a simplified model where you have, um, you have an upstream community that protects water, keeps water clean. Downstream, you have users who pay for that service upstream. So for example, in, in, um, in the New York City, in the, the Hudson River watershed, um, New York City avoids really costly investments in water filtration in terms of their water supply by paying farmers upstream to keep the water clean before it even goes into the, into the drinking water. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the simplest form of explaining it. Um, in terms of how that sort of thing is different from some of the other programs, conservation programs around agriculture, um, this slide sort of lays out some of some of those differences. And um, that this is not intended to argue that payment for ecosystem service programs should supplant existing conservation programs. There's a lot of great conservation programs out there that have 
good track records um, of providing revenue streams to farmers and improving environmental performance on farms. Um, and there's a bunch of funding associated with them, and a bunch of them are in that in the uh, the Build Back Better Act that, that we just looked at. Um, but some of the ways that ecosystem service payment programs are a little bit different is that it in one in ecosystem service payment programs that are outcome based, the payment amounts vary based on performance instead of um, so instead of paying for a practice like a cover crop. Um, so, you know, say you pay $25 an acre for a farmer to plant cover crops on, on their land. Um, instead, you pay for the outcomes of that cover cropping. So you might, you know, you might take a baseline of water holding capacity on that field. And after a year or two or three of cover cropping or of alley cropping or of no-till or whatever the practices are that you're following, ostensibly you're increasing the water holding capacity on that field. And so you're being paid for the increase in water holding capacity on the field or, you know, or infiltration rates, increases in infiltration rate on the field or decreases in, in erosion or decreases in runoff or there, there's a bunch of different metrics that, that could be tied to payments. Um, and one of the exciting things about um, sort of locally based payment for ecosystem service programs is that they can be responsive to local ecosystem concerns. And so in, in our region, and I'm gonna jump on to the next slide, which has a little more detail of what we're working on here. Um, in our region, water is a big deal. And in my conversations with community members, as, as we at CCE Tompkins are, are looking to get a pilot program off the ground around payments for ecosystem, ecosystem services, conversations with community members highlight water and flooding, flooding as a challenge, harmful algal blooms as a challenge, more so necessarily than sequestering carbon. Although, as Joshua explained, somewhere, and, and I've seen pretty good numbers that, that that corroborate what, what Joshua was saying, somewhere around 20,000 gallons per acre of water held in the soil by each additional percent of organic matter. Um, and that organic matter is, I, I'm not gonna remember the number off the top of my head, somewhere around 50% carbon. Um, so increases in, in water holding capacity in your soil are also often closely tied with increases in, in carbon content in your soil. So. If, if we're paying farmers to increase their water holding capacity, they're also sequestering carbon and having impacts on climate change, in addition to gaining resilience with respect to, to climate change. Um, so the, the work that we've done thus far has mainly been securing funding so that we can hire somebody to, to really commit, uh, commit a bunch of time toward establishing um, payment mechanisms and protocols and doing the farmer outreach that, that it'll take to create a payment for ecosystem services program in our region. Um, so we're currently seeking farmer input, seeking pilot participants in this program, and we're right in the middle of hiring the ecosystem, the, the payment for ecosystem services educator. Hope to have them on board in, in December. So with that, um, yeah, that's that's where I'll leave it, and I'll I'll turn it over to to Steve Gabriel. Um, I see there's oh yeah. yeah Joshua put a couple things in the chat. Yeah, there were some questions in the chat um, that were directed towards Joshua, and I don't know if any have been added. Uh, let's see, where is the chat? So, why don't you? Um, can you see the chat, Graham? I can, yeah. I, th I think um, the only question I see there was one that it looks like Joshua answered. I should have I should have made it clear that please ask questions. <laughs> I forgot yeah. to say Right, that. I should have mentioned that too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I should have too. But we were disrupted at the beginning and sort of got lost in the shuffle. Um, yeah. Joshua, there was a question on who measured this among us fungus and, and how did they yeah. uh, uh, find out about it? Uh, Good question. How was it discovered? And I, think, I think it sounded like to me from reading a little bit about it, they did some genetic analysis 
and they can discern, you know, sampling soil. You know, this is this, these organisms are like acres. They cover acres. Like, I can't remember how many, but something like this. The biggest one was like a thousand six hundred and sixty-five. This size of a thousand six hundred sixty-five football fields. So, um, it was thousands of acres. So yeah. they could, I think, do genetic analysis to find the boundaries of an, of a single um, organism. I think that was a, there was a woman that discovered it, a woman who was uh, involved in uh, a forest there. And in fact, a book has been written about it. I, if anybody's interested, I will try to look up the name. Cool. Um, but can't remember it offhand. Yeah, great. I didn't know that. Um, so are there anything else here that we want to look into what what is eric do you want to explain what this quote this uh link is uh sure so he mentioned um graham mentioned the equip program eqip we actually just finished um a year of that we got funded to have somebody do um an analysis of our property for wildflower planting or pollinator plantings. And now that will get submitted. And then if that gets approved, we can get that funded to start the process of planting out um, wildflower um, plantings next year. Um, and it's, it's like a three or four year process uh, that will eventually establish acres of wildflowers on our property along with um, fruit trees and other things that we worked into the plan as part of our overall permaculture plan. Was that from the USDA or how did you, who did you apply to? NRCS, it's a program under NRCS. NRCS. Yeah, yep. Um, there was a talk at the Dammy Town Hall a couple, two years ago or three years maybe even Lance Ebel gave that turned me on to the program and we applied and got accepted, so. Who could you talk to now if you were interested? Is that in Cortland? No, it's downtown and um, Erin Kurtz, I think is her name. I can, I'll look it up quick and I'll post it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Yep. I tried to, I looked into the uh, high, their high tunnel program that, um, that Graham mentioned, but I couldn't sell them on the fact that I was growing soil microbes rather than plants <laughs> i tried <clears throat> it, it, i may, I may yet figure out a way i may yet <laughs> figure out a way to do that sometime to <laughs> but what, what did you say betsy no i just was talking about the but i have to add a comment here that i saw um josh's compost and it is spectacular I have never seen a compost with so many filaments, fungi filaments going through it. It was beautiful. Uh, so if he wants to grow it under uh, some sort of cover, certainly I would be a person to vouch for him. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, Steve. I just bought a secondhand high you're welcome. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve, sorry. <laughs> Cool, can you all hear me? Okay. I see you around. I am here, yes. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I'm gonna share my slides here. Um, cool, so I wear a couple of hats and relate to regenerative ag in, in both facets of, of the work I'm doing, which one is um, my wife, myself, and our son steward a piece of land that we call Wellspring Forest Farm with the website in the chat. Um, and and are, are exploring and trying to practice different different things and learn as we go. We've been on this land for um, 10 years now. So yeah, and I feel like we're just getting, get, getting started and I'll share a bit about that. But I was sort of tasked to share some case studies and some examples of, of Regen Ag kind of in the area and, and in the broader sphere and just kind of put some with some resources in front of you. Um, one thing I'll mention is I think the woman you all are talking about is uh, Suzanne Samard, 
who's right. a forester in British Columbia and wrote a wonderful book called Finding the Mother Tree and also has a lot of videos and, and resources online. It's a really wonderful um, scientist that really is breaking ground at really understanding specifically how fungi are playing a role in carbon and in forest health and trees and all that good stuff. So thank you very much for bringing. Uh, yes, that. well, I'm, li I'm listening to the book currently on <laughs> audio, so it's helpful to, <laughs> it's right at the tip of my tongue. So, um, so I wanna start out with, this is kind of the human element in many ways and, and, and showing some different examples of ways humans are interacting with regenerative ag. Um, and I think it's important to just like from the outset note that regen ag is this new word, but it um, can give the false sense that it's a new idea. And so, um, and, and some, some other things like agroforestry and permaculture and a lot of these named things that in the, maybe in the past 20, 30, 40 years have, have had that term but have a much longer history and um, it is an indigenous history that that every piece of land that people find themselves on has um, and I've been fortunate enough to have a neighbor and a friend that I've learned a lot from Mike Damon who's a forester in the area um, if you ever uh, happen to be able to catch and and learn from is, is a really valuable resource um, so he grew up in the Seneca nation and really brings a perspective to uh, to forest management and to, to land use that, um, that I've gained a lot from. And so I wanna just um, mention Mike and, and encourage you all to keep your eyes out for him in the, in the local scene. So he lives over here on the west side of Ithaca um, near Hector and Mecklenburg, which is where our farm is. So, um, and, and I've learned a lot just digging into the lands that we're on and recognizing that indigenous story. I was fortunate at uh, being an employee of Cornell to be able to take a class on the Goyan Cornell or the Cuga language and learn um, how to say those, th some of the words and, and name these places. And it's important for me to acknowledge that as someone who's on the land. And part of regenerative agriculture, I think, is, um, is considering the longer story of, of humans on the landscape and not seeing this is separate from the sort of um, biology or nature or, or the different pieces that we, we often bring to the table. And there's some really cool stories about regenerative agriculture that are happening around New York State in relationship to native sovereignty. Um, and I think that, um, so I think regeneration often can be thought of just in the ecological sense, but what I'm seeing are communities. I'm also thinking about the regeneration of culture and the regeneration of practices. So the Seneca Nation has a farm that's, that's relatively new that um, is both working with grazing animals and soil building as well as uh, maple syrup production. There was an article in Civil Eats relatively recently about that. And you can follow them on social media and things like that. But a uh, very interesting farm down in western New York um, that is exciting to see and um, you know bison being not just a um, a food source but also a very culturally relevant food source and what I learned from taking the Goyang Kono the Kyuga language class is that some words that are spoken in the language don't have relevance unless they're tied to an agricultural practice and so naming the buffalo the parts of the buffalo learning uh, how to process and carve is, is part of that and I think um, if we're going to be truly regenerative in some of these practices we have to kind of dig deep into into some of these uh, longer longer term understandings of, of relationship to land and relationship to farming and crops so another place to go visit that's amazing if you haven't this is like sort of in our backyard and I feel like not well known is the the state um, coordinates a site called uh, Ganondigan and it's up in Victor near, near um, Rochester and um, is, a, is a site you can go visit and learn about the Seneca Nation and it's it's an amazing landmark it's and it's one of the only uh, the, their website says it's the only um, Seneca town but I think it's one of the only native towns that's actually developed and interpreted in the U.S. so preserving that information and that knowledge and there's a wonderful project that they run called the White Corn Project which is working on seed uh, restoration so restoring old seed varieties that thrive in this kind of climate and have a cultural relevance as well. Um, and that's gonna be a part of regenerative agriculture is preserving, preserving culture, preserving language, preserving genetics um, in some of the plants and things that we need to be thinking about. Um, and I'll put a shout out as well to another really great. So I, so I think um, one way to honor and, and learn about indigenous land use and, and consider that as, as nested within this larger umbrella of regenerative agriculture is to um, recognize that the indigenous communities in this country have a lot to teach us about um, practices and ways that um, 
that we can be regenerative. And so if you haven't heard of or checked out the film Inhabitants, um, a good friend of mine, and he worked on our farm for a bit, um, filmed this and traveled across the country and uh, sort of worked with a, a number of different communities this is an event that's actually coming up on Monday, which is cool. And you can um, go to the film website and sign up for it. But they're doing little uh, viewings and sort of interviews with some of the, the folks um, featured in the film. Um, so kind of breaking down the different parts, but um, really interesting to, in this case, learn from um, tribal members of the Karuk community in California talking about prescribed fire and the ways that that can be and, and is a really important land use practice that um, had we not uh, abolished outright or, or severely diminished, <clears throat> especially in the West, I know, um, we wouldn't have some of the exacerbated wildfires that we see as a, as a product of, of climate change kind of spiraling out of control. So that's a great resource to, to check out as well. Um, kind of trickling down like further into community aspects and cultural aspects, a big element of agriculture in this country is um, what I'd say is like the black experience of agriculture and soul fire farms in the Albany area and is doing a lot of work to reconnect folks to farming and explore um, cultural and historical techniques and traditions and connect folks to the land and to their relationship to the land. And amazing book by Leah Penniman, who's one of the founders of this group, Farming While Black, which really gets into some of the story and, and, and digs in. So, so from these folks' perspective, regenerative agriculture also includes um, reparations, rematriation, um, and a lot of dif difficult conversations, frankly, that um, I'm fortunate to be occasionally a part of, would like to be more, but to think about some of the ways that we're gonna share land, share resources, and, and make sure that um, regenerative ag is, is accessible and equitable to all. And it's great that the legislation is, is that the language is showing up in there to at least um, acknowledge and honor that. And locally, we have a really wonderful champion of some of these things and many regenerative farming practices. Um, if you're not familiar with Rafa Aponte in Freeville and Rocky Acres Community Farm. And Rafa is sometimes really hard to get a hold of because he is busy serving on all sorts of wonderful <clears throat> organizations, including the Climate Advisory Council for for the New York legislation. So advising on the implementation of the climate plan with working with the Young Farmer Coalition and working with the Black Farmer Fund, which is a organization based in New York um, supporting uh, new black farmers in the state. So, um, but his farm is local as well and you can check him out and support his work as well on mul multitudes of levels. Um, certainly practicing Regen Ag, both environmentally and sort of socially and culturally at the same time. And, um, the last one I'll, I'll share is sort of the, the human element is something that I'm, it's dear to my heart. I'm on the board of the Youth Farm Project, um, and which is based in Danby. So I wanted to give a shout out and, and also a plug as a good board member for, <clears throat> for our year end campaign, which you can uh, donate to and support. So amazing program that employs youth uh, in the county and some surrounding areas to, to learn and connect to agriculture and to grow food and medicine for, for the community. So a lot of that. Um, production goes back into uh, different different areas of uh, of need in the community, and so we're supporting youth and supporting the community at the same time, and and um, and regenerating soil. So, I think youth and youth education and um, training the next generation is a really critical part of of Regen Ag um, as well. So, um, for me, like. I, I share some other sort of cultural traditions, cultural connections. Um, my journey into Regen Ag and, and thinking about this has also led to me looking to my past and some of my ancestry and heritage and led, led to practices that aren't just about some physical act on the landscape where we're, you know, um, cutting something down or planting soil or planting a cover crop, but also steeped in much deeper stories of tradition and, and, and ways that we relate to landscape. So, I was fortunate a few years ago to be in the UK where some of my ancestry is from and learn the technique of hedge laying, which is a agroforestry. It could be called a regenerative ag practice, but really it's a, it's a uh, agrarian tradition from, from the United Kingdom and parts of the world. And, and actually a practice that we see globally as a way that farmers learn to use vegetation in the landscape as essentially a livestock bear. This was the original fencing, but it's a whole intricate set of knowledge and tools and practices of how to, um, cut this material and weave it and create these living fences that um, some of them I, I visited in the UK were four or 500 years old, right? So 
So when we think about the connections between uh, culture and tradition and some of these practices, we see them endure. And I think those are the kind of things we'd be thinking about um, with Regen Ag, which is a very new term, um, but we have a lot of wealth and, and um, knowledge to draw upon if we, if we look in the right places. Um, so a little from the sort of carbon side of, of Regen Ag, which is really what has, um, I think, elevated it in the, in the conversation. Um, this is a, a wonderful book that came out um, several years ago now, but really outlines a lot of um, important uh, aspects of our of our lives as a whole that are we need to pay attention to in order to um, draw down uh, really the emissions that we are are putting out as a result of the way that we live our lives. So it's not just agriculturally based. There's a number of different things. For instance, reducing food waste is one of the number one things we can do to reduce global emissions. Um, and actually one of the easiest things to do in, in many senses. But of course we could couple reducing food waste with composting or building soil if we just connect the right dots, right? So, so it's a really great resource, but what shows up again and again in Drawdown, it's basically a list of the top 100 solutions, the things we need to focus on is regenerative agriculture and other practices sort of keep showing up um, as, as really important components. And um, a colleague of mine, Eric Tonsmeyer, did a lot of work with the, the agriculture and the agroforestry aspect. And so this chart is a summary of his very detailed analysis, along with uh, hundreds of other scientists around the world to look at different um, land use practices and how they sort of fit on the scale. And I don't want to present this as a, um, if you look at this chart, there's a number of different practices on the left side and, and the dots are showing sort of um, how much estimated uh, carbon sequestration they can they can result in. So as you move from left to right, the systems that have the dots further to the right, you're going to see more carbon sequestered in terms of these models. But that's not to say that therefore um, the ones that are you know the most carbon are therefore the best or the most appropriate or that they're going to be enacted at the same scale necessarily. So most of our food is still coming from annual production systems, which are kind of down here on the left side. And there's a lot within those we can do to um, increase cover cropping to reduce tillage, and those have some really short-term effects. But long-term, what we're really gonna have to do is transition to more perennial systems that do rely on trees and permanent cover on the ground and a lot of the things that Joshua mentioned. Um, and so for us as, as starting out a farm and, and looking at this climate in this part of the world, the other thing is that a lot of regenerative ag practices often are, are spoken as if um, one practice should be done everywhere in the world. And um, it's it's actually needs to be very, uh, climate and bioregion and sort of local uh, specific, which ones and which which types of practices work well. Um, so here we are in, in at our farm, and this is a you know a, a typical hillside farm in in this part of the state, which is heavy clay soils, um, not very much organic matter, not very much topsoil. A lot of that's washed away. We are <clears throat> just essentially equidistant from the bottom of Cuga Lake, the bottom of Seneca Lake, right in the middle. As you look uh, to the south of us on a map, you would see more forest, more rocky, more sloped areas that don't have a lot of sort of traditional uh, or sort of, I should say, more modern agricultural productivity. They're not easy to plow until essentially. And as you move forth, if you go up to Trumansburg and further north, you start to see flatter, more open and more well-drained land, which is where all the grains and, and corn and, and heavy crops are grown. And as you go up towards Rochester, you're getting into some of the, the prime areas for barley and flowers and things like that. So heavy grain crops, right? So we have different, even just starting where I am and driving up north to, to Rochester, you have many different microclimates, many different types of um, systems that may be aligned to different types of, of Regen Ag. So for us, back to where we are, we have um, heavy clay soils, sloped soils, uh, not great to, to plow up a bunch, but great to keep in permanent cover and to add trees to. That's what really will thrive in this type of system. So for us, um, thinking about the type of livestock we want to work with, we chose sheep over cows because of um, the hoof impact and the sort of uh, potential for increasing erosion on our site which was a smaller animal in that case. Um, we, we thought really carefully to say our, our goal is to keep the land in permanent cover. That's one of the first things we can do is, is, um, is cultivate uh, healthy pasture mixes and keep there. And what that can do in the short term is increase carbon stocks in the soil. Um, and as we've reiterated time and time again, the soil is really the basis of 
of regen ag and of carbon sequestration and of sort of the, the ways that we could activate um, a health in the landscape. Um, but the reality with that is that can happen in the short term. And we found in our 10 years of being on the farm, we've been able to raise our organic matter like 1% or so. So our soils were showing at like four, four and a half percent. Now they're up in five, sometimes five and a half percent, mostly just through rotational grazing and some of the practices that we've installed. So that's really exciting, um, but we're actually kind of hitting the peak. So a lot of the soils that are our type can't um, get much past like 6% organic matter. So if we're gonna store carbon in the long term, where are we gonna put that energy? And that energy is gonna come from, from trees. And it's actually not just the above ground mass of trees, but also the root systems of trees that are going to hold a lot of that carbon long term. Um, so this is where agroforestry really is showing up in a lot of this uh, climate legislation because the combination of good healthy soil uh, building practices and then trees really uh, creates a, a short term and a long term kind of plan. Um, and that's really what's enticed us to keep going and think about it. And animals are really um, the drivers of the system. As Joshua mentioned, we are constantly having animals moving through the landscape and clipping that material. and pooping it back on the ground and that is activating and releasing and making available so much for all that so soil microbiology that's down underneath. Um, but for us as, as farmers, what's important is to also think about climate resiliency. Um, so if you haven't noticed, we're in a, a swinging pendulum sort of one season is, is a little too wet. That's where we are this year. And it seems like last year uh, was one of the driest seasons on record. And the year before that was kind of wet. And we're kind of swinging back and forth between these extremes, which means that in, in supporting our animals' health and, and well-being, um, we're not always able to rely on just the, the pasture grasses and the kind of traditional forages for them. And we've been experimenting a lot with tree fodder which is really um, growing trees partially for their carbon benefits, partially for the shade and shelter they offer animals, but also um, to feed them. And especially during drought times, these are really significant uh, sources of food. So here's some of our sheep uh, munching on black locust in this case, which is a phenomenal tree uh, in an agroforestry or regenerative system. Um, it fixes nitrogen, it builds soil, it is, it is priming the soil with lots of microbiology. It is a high protein feed. It's a great tree for pollinators. It has all sorts of benefits in the landscape. And then the wood that's grown is actually incredibly rot resistant. The old farmer saying was, uh, I should say black locust was often used. Um, it has been traditionally used for fence posts. And the old saying was that you put your black locust post in the ground, you put a rock on top. And when the rock decomposes, it's time to replace your fence post. <laughs> so it lasts, well, every time I put a locust post and I know it's probably going to be around longer than I will be. Um, and so that's really helpful from a fence building perspective or building perspective, but it's also um, from a carbon perspective, that's very locked up. That's not going anywhere for a long time. So growing wood and then putting it into buildings is a form of carbon sequestration um, that, that we can think about and tying together in some of these systems. So coupled with the the intentional, the intentional grazing that we're doing that we're seeing building, uh, building health in the soil, the trees that we're putting in, we, we are dealing a lot with water and water management. And I think that um, Graham underscored this, that that's gonna be the theme in our local area is more likely than not, we're gonna have too much water um, than too little. And it's coming and it, just in the 10 years I've seen, it's amazing to think about when I, I actually grew up in this area and our rain events used to be these nice little drizzles, you know, quarter inch here, half inch here. And it kind of like, it's like someone was kind of turning on, on the sprinkler on and off. And as we started farming, it's like everything comes in these deluges, these absolute downpours. And that can really overwhelm the, the systems that we have. And we see that and, and this water is ending up um, ultimately in our lakes. Um, and that is taking soil with it and taking all sorts of different things. So our, our land actually is at the top of Taganak Creek's watershed and eventually flows down into the creek and over Taganak Falls. Um, and when we got to the land, one of the things we noticed is, is gullies in a lot of the, the hillsides where the water was rushing off. So this is a sloped area here. And one of the things we've worked on is some, some water harvesting techniques. These are swales that we designed to be able to handle um, water runoff in the heaviest of rain events. So this is a four inch rain event here. And all that water is, is sitting in this ditch rather than washing soil down the hill and into the creek and eventually over the, the waterfall. And what it does is it allows that water to slow down and soak in over the next few days rather than overwhelming something that just kind of washes down the slope. Um, 
And so we can install these kind of mechanisms and the intersection of grazing and trees and, and water is something that we're thinking about um, as a regenerative agriculture practice that's really appropriate to, to this wet, cool, heavy clay soil type climate. Um, and um, I was fortunate enough a few years ago to go to an agroforestry conference in, in Canada and um, I'm doing a lot of research now with willow. What's, what's amazing about willow is that we can create um, uh, buffers of willow that intercept and, and capture fertilizer. So nitrates and phosphates being huge runoff um, components in a lot of our landscapes and causing a lot of issues um, with um, algal blooms, the harmful algal blooms, the, um, the types of things that we're seeing that are uh, creating lots of problems in the lake. Well, we can intercept those and willow is an amazing uh, tree that can actually partition uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and hold it and grow even better. It's using it basically as a fertilizer. So this was um, a planting just downslope from a potato field. The, the, the bay is just below uh, to the left of the picture and this, this willow was intercepting essentially 90% of all that fer fertility. Um, so it wasn't going into the waterway and it was turning into this really useful material um, for a lot of different things in the landscape. So. So I think combining uh, these different aspects is something to consider when we think about regenerative agriculture. Um, another example, this is in Watkins Glen, Brett Chedzoy, who's a cooperative extension um, comrade um, at Schuyler County, has an amazing example of a regenerative agriculture system based on civil pasture, which is combining trees and livestock and grazing systems. He's doing it on, I think, the, one of the biggest scales I know of um, in, in the whole Northeast region. Um, so he's grazing close to 500 acres with cattle um, in a sustainable manner. And about half of that is silvopasture, pasture, both planted um, forests like the one you see here, as well as uh, woodlands that he's thinned out and created more forage for the animals. And, and Brett is just reporting time and time again, seeing the benefits of that, both in climate resiliency and also as he thinks about how to reduce emissions and have a more positive effect. So um, in the climate conversation, animals are often um, considered one of the bad players, but it's not the animals that are the bad players, it's the way that we're working with them. So when we put animals in one, in one confined environment, uh, methane and um, carbon dioxide and all these things can build up and become a pollution problem. But when they're out on a landscape like this and, and rotationally grazed, that, um, that waste is actually feeding a soil food web, which is feeding a positive loop in the system. And so, so again, it's not the cow's fault. It's really the way that humans are choosing to work with these animals. And I think animals are probably one of the most important components of, of scaling um, regenerative ag and seeing the, the soil. Because I know we have a small little garden, we make compost, but we can't, um, we can't make compost on a 500 acre scale. <laughs> but this is an example of a farm that's really um, doing that soil building work on, on a pretty large scale. And again, it's all in concert with different things. So the, the forest you're seeing in these slides is a black locust, um, black walnut planting that Brett did um, back in his 30s and is now a mature forest that he's uh, sustainably harvesting wood from. Again, this is black locust here that he used to uh, fence his farm and then also can sell as a, as a product. It's a very high, high value product right now. Um, people are looking for um, rot resistant posts to start gardens and, and do all sorts of projects. And so it's a way to the, the landowner can regenerate um, some revenue as well. Okay, other examples, a couple more. Um, uh, Graham mentioned alley cropping. So this is a good example of alley cropping where you have an agroforestry system where trees are widely spaced and then other crops are grown in between. And um, at the example of this, the Finger Lake Cider House or, or Good Life Farm, this was a strategy for them to start to um, produce some, some uh, crops from the land um, while they're sort of waiting for their apple trees to come online. So apples and, and peaches are the main uh, fruits that are growing there. And so Thanksgiving turkeys um, became a way to have an annual return from that while the trees are really taking eight or 10 years before they're really productive. Um, but there's secondary and, and, and tertiary benefits to having the turkeys in there as well. So um, fertility um, is a big, fertility cycling would be another big factor, pest control, um, uh, uh, processing all the drops uh, as, the, as the trees are starting to produce fruit can be really important. That can be important to break pest cycles to not have that fruit rotting on the ground and, and perpetuating some of those issues. And so um, 
this this type of system allows for multiple crops to be produced in the same space and for the the interaction of the benefits of those those systems to, to sort of work together <clears throat> and they're on different they're different time scales and different different scales of production as well so um another uh cider orchard that's a, a friend of ours up the road <clears throat> redbird cider um in the in the case before here we have turkeys that are also produced as a as a as a crop for sale um, at Redbird. They're mostly using animals to support the tree crops, and so they have just a handful of sheep and a handful of geese. And um, with the right amount of geese, they've been actually able to more or less eliminate mowing the orchard in the summer, which is a huge um, time savings for them. It's um, reducing the use of a fossil fuel machine to to do that work. And of course, the geese are also doing some pest and some fertility work at the same time. Um, and, and helping to really stimulate and, and expand that soil food web. They use sheep in the spring and in the fall. They don't really want them in there during the growing season because they can do damage to the trees, but they can run them in the alleyways in the spring as a way to clean up stuff before the, the trees are really coming out. And then in the fall, let them kind of through the orchard as a way to clean up drops again and help with some of that cycling. So these are systems that are coming out of people's ingenuity and thinking about what are the ways that we can learn from nature and think about how to um, bring these elements together in these kind of integrated ways. Um, and that's really what I'm seeing and excited about with, with um, all these different examples of how people are, are expressing regenerative agriculture. So Jonathan, I am filling in for him tonight. Um, we hope his family is doing well and recovering from, from the tragedy they experienced. Um, I know they're doing okay, but uh, it'll be a long road. Uh, but they, uh, Jonathan and Meg and um, Jesse started out in Western Massachusetts. And um, I wanted to show this picture and just tell a little story because this is, I, I shared a bunch of examples of Regen Ag on the farm scale and the larger scale, but there's a lot of really cool stuff happening on the backyard of the sort of micro scale that are really important. Um, and so this is, a, this is their backyard in Holyoke and I couldn't find the before picture, but just imagine a completely barren, desolate, open backyard with not even grass growing. It was really, um, quite uh, a, a moonscape when they arrived there. And um, um, him and Eric Tonesmeyer are good friends. They they rented this uh, two, two unit du duplex, uh, just at the sort of bottom of this photo. And over time, they, they basically started to, to first build the soil, uh, bring in a lot of fertility, and then add plants in, in a method called forest gardening, or sometimes people call it forest farming. But it's really thinking about growing an edible medicinal sort of food forest and packing as much as you can into one little space. So, so on our farm over um, 50 acres, we may be working with only a handful of species because at that scale, you have to kind of keep it a bit simpler. But in here in this, um, I think it's a 10th of an acre, um, there might be hundreds and hundreds of these different species um, packed in and just providing a whole bunch of um, different benefits, both to the environment and, and to the folks that are living there as well. So they talked about the journey of going from the barren lot to this oasis in a book called Paradise Lot. That's a really good read uh, to check out. But this idea of sort of um, propagating, growing lots of things, uh, forest gardening, um, um, is, is a really important one. I think a good place for a lot of us to start, no matter where we're at, is learning to, to propagate trees, to grow out woody plants, to, um, <clears throat> to put some of these um, plants in the ground and just get to know them. Uh, start small. Don't try to get to know 100 at, at, the, at the outset. You know, Add a few each year. But there's a lot of ways that we can all engage and start to think about building these. And, and this sort of uh, temperate forest garden is, is something that we see as a... Um, something that we've seen in many other parts of the world um, called home gardens, where we have these productive edible places. And it's an old agroforestry practice that um, could happen a lot more places in, in North America. And um, <clears throat> there are community food forests now popping up all over the US. So this website has a whole map of different ones that are showing up. It's pretty remarkable to see. And what's cool about this, again, to tie it back, is it's not just about um, an ecological function, and it doesn't succeed with just that being the goal. It succeeds because communities get involved and people get involved and they're embedded in that as a project and as a source of food and medicine and learning and skill building and all those good things. So, um, and there's a handbook that came out of that project um, that describes some of the best practices if you want to start a community food forest, which is pretty cool. And finally, I'll just mention a couple food forests uh, geeks around <laughs> in our local area. These are actually some of the, the better nurseries for trees in the whole Northeast region. I mean, we're really blessed in this area that we can um, 
find folks who are doing some really innovative work. And I've only scratched the surface of what could be many, many slides of many cool individuals and projects um, happening. But um, I want to mention Twisted Tree, Akiva, Silver, and, um, and Sean and Sasha um, and Juan who run Edible Acres. As, as some really good resources to, to find some trees and to learn how to plant them and to, um, and to find plants that are multifunctional, good for you, good for your family and good for, the, good for the land at the same time. So they're both really committed to not just growing the material, but really teaching folks how to, um, how to do it. And hopefully one of these years, um, Akiva will be able to bring back the Nut Bonanza because every November that was a phenomenal event um, uh, just to learn about nut trees in particular and to eat lots of nuts with, with folks. Um, so hopefully that's a, a number of examples I tried to pull out just to give you some nice pictures to end the night. Um, I appreciate everyone's contributions to, to this talk. And I think we have a nice, uh, gave you a nice rounded sense of, of Regen Ag and, and some folks to, to reach out to to learn more. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. That was really an interesting combination of people coming from different angles on the same subject. So um, great talk. Um, does anybody have any questions they want anybody to answer before we say it's a late day? <laughs> uh, Violet, you have a question? Uh, or no, just no, they're just telling Josh it's time for us to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that okay uh thank you all for coming and uh, it's been a wonderful evening thank you thank you that was thank great everybody. great yeah. to see you all thank you, so, um, thank you. bye bye <laughs>